All right, the next crime we're going to talk about is astrology. Astrology was rampant. It was practiced not just by laymen, but by apostate antipopes, kings, apostate anti-cardinals, and other so-called prelates. It was rampant. It was throughout the whole university system. And astrology is a false religion that worships and adores the stars and also the false gods of mythology. So anybody who practices astrology is an idolater, period. End of discussion. And it was rampant. And we're going to read about that now. The first thing we're going to read from is a Catholic Encyclopedia article on astrology by Max Jacobi, 1907. Emperors and posts became votaries of astrology. The emperors, Charles IV and V, Charles V was the father of the apostate King Philip II, and popes Sixtus IV, Julius II, Leo X, and Paul III. When these rulers lived, astrology was, so to say, the regular of regulator of official life. It is, in fact, characteristic of the age that at the papal and imperial courts, ambassadors were not received in audience until the court astrologer had been consulted. Among the zealous patrons of the art were the Medici. Catherine de Medici made astrology popular in France. She erected an astrological observatory for herself near Paris, and her court astrologer was a celebrated magician, Michel de Nostradamus. How do you like that? All right. Now we're going to read. Oh, no, it goes on, it goes on more here. Nostradamus, who in 1555 published his principal work on astrology, a work still regarded as authoritative among the followers of this art. You know, people who practice astrology are warlocks. They're like male witches. And that's what we're talking about all these people here, these so-called popes, apostate anti-popes. Another well-known man was Lucas Garricus, the court astrologer of Pope Leo X. And Clement VII, there's another one, Clement VII practiced astrology, who published a large number of astrological treatises. There were special professors of astrology besides these for astronomy at the universities of Pavia, Bologna, and even the Sapienza during the pontificate of Leo X, while at times these astrologers outranked the astronomers. The three intellectual centers of astrology in the most brilliant period of the Renaissance were Bologna, Milan, and Mantua. And that was from the Catholic Encyclopedia article. Now we're going to read from the history of popes by the notorious heretic Ludwig Pastor. One of the special dangers uh, accompanying the rage of the antique in the age of the Renaissance was that many were drawn to it, that many were drawn by it to adopt the superstitions of the ancient world. The danger was further enhanced by an influence of Arabic learning, which was already begun to be very considerable in the time of Emperor Frederick II. The commonest form of superstition was astrology, the pursuit of which was usually combined with astronomy. During the whole of the 15th century and part of the 16th, the belief that the future could be read by means of horoscopes of the relative positions of the planets in regard to each other and to the signs of the zodiac were almost universal. That's how rampant it was. They were all doing it. And it was, and as you can see in this picture, I'm going to show you right now, it reflects the art in these churches, some of them which had the zodiac in it. The ch their churches were desecrated with the zodiac, the mythological pagan gods and all that of the zodiac, as you can see here in these churches. A complicated system was developed in which various a attributes founded on more or less erroneous notions of the characters of the ancient gods. See, that's what do. it's all the false gods. And you're also worshiping the stars, too. It's star worship. We're ascribed to each of the planets. Men were firmly convinced that the destinies of each individual largely depended on the influence of the planets, not instead of God, under which he or she was born, or, or instead of God is gracious in your own free will cooperation or the devil's temptations, these latter being also controlled by the constellations through which they pass. Only a few of the most eminent men, such as Pius II, were able to shake off these superstitions. And most of the universities, side by side with the professors of astronomy, there were professors of astrology who propounded systems and wrote treatises on their su special subject. Every little court had its astronomer. Sometimes, as in Mantua, there were more than one. No resolution on any important matter was taken without consulting the stars. Instead of God, the stars! Right? This is back, this is so abominable, you can't believe it. And even trifling details, details such as the journeys of members of the family. 
the reception of foreign envoys, the taking of medicine, were all determined by astrology. Daredevil soldiers of fortune such as Bartolomeo Alviano and Bartolomeo Orsini and Paolo Vitelli believed in it. Against the universi uh, 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 believed in amongst the universities, those of Padua, Milan, and Bologna were special homes. But its influence is to be found everywhere in the calendar, in medicine, and all the current beliefs of popular prophecies. Things have come to such a pass, says Roberto Di Lecce, in one of his sermons, that people hardly dare to eat anything or put new clothes, or put on new clothes, or begin the most trifling undertakings without consulting the stars. It's bad. This is how bad it is, right? It's reflecting in her art. Astrology was so bound up in the Italian life that many, even of the popes, I say, we say, of course, apostate anti popes, Sixtus IV, Julius II, Leo X, and still later Paul III were influenced by the notions of their time. The famous Cristofaro Landini seriously hoped to forecast the future of Christianity by means of the science of the stars. The stars! Not the prophecies from the true prophets and our Lord Jesus Christ, the prophet of all prophets, and St. John who was given the apocalypse. No, they're going to the stars. Oh, my Lord, you, you almost can't believe it, you know, when you're reading this here. The pious Domenico di Domenici pronounced the discourse in praise and defense of astrology. Astrological and astronomical ideas supplied congenial material to the artists of the time who delighted in representations of the signs of the zodiac and personifications of the stars and the planetary deities, as you have just seen in this, the picture just before. The frescoes of Palazzo, Schifonia in Ferrara, and the Borgia apartment in the Vatican are well-known instances of these. The astrological teachings in regard to the offspring of the planets found definite expression in the time of the Renaissance in the so-called signs of the planets. A distinct type of these symbols appeared in the middle of the 15th century. It probably originated in Florence, again with the Medicis. This is like the center of evil where a lot of stuff is really coming from. Passed from Italy into the Netherlands and thence into Germany and held its ground well into the early part of the 16th century. That was volume 5, the introduction, page 2, pages 148 to 150. Now we're going to read from the history of popes again. Uh, from volume 5, book 2, chapter 4, page 450, the French king, Charles VIII, decided to make his formal entry into Rome on St. Sylvester Day, which had been declared auspicious by the astrologers. So there's another one. There he is. The French king, Charles VIII, was an apostate bastard, practiced astrology, they all did. I mean, it's got, look, here's another one from History of Popes. Volume 4, the appendix, page 485, Frederick, this, uh, it's a footnote, Frederick III was greatly given to astrology, and they give you the sources on all of this. Frederick III's another one. Now, we're also going to read in History of Popes, um, Volume 4, Book 1, Chapter 2, Page 60, that also uh, Paul II practiced astrology. Amongst other reproaches brought by Amanati against Paul II is that of having, in 1465, firmly believed in astrological predictions. All right. Again, History of Popes, Volume 6, Book 2, Chapter 2, page 233. Everything depended on the attitude taken up by the new Pope Julius II, whose coronation took place with great pomp on the 28th of November, 1503. And there's a footnote that says, uh, description of November 20 on the coronation itself, the day for which had been fixed in accordance with the horoscope taken by astrologers. This is out and out. These guys are warlocks. They're not popes. How can a warlock be the head of a church? How can a guy who practices astrology, which is star worship and the idolization, the, and, and, and also for its false gods and mythological gods, be considered a pope? No way, pal. And pastor refers to them as popes and all and talks good, good about these people. This alone. You're done, pal. You're out of here. I'm gone. You're out. I don't know nothing about you. Just on this alone. Now we read also in History of Popes. Volume 8, chapter 6, page 273. Leo X's reign is afforded by an official register of professors belonging to the year 1514. The number of names does not fall short of 88. Almost all divisions were uh, under more than one professor. Philosophy and theology, number 17, Greek 3, astrology and botany have one each. This astrology too, again, with Leo X. Now we're going to get into yet some more hypocrisies. It never ends, folks. It just never ceases to amaze me. 
We're going to talk about apostate anti Pope Sixtus V's condemnation of astrology. Oh, he condemns it. Oh, very well. He condemns it, but it's still insufficient. And we're going to explain to you why. He condemns astrology as heretical. He's right. As contrary to the Catholic faith, he's right. But he never denounces the people who practiced it as former heretics and idolaters, and he never punished them because he never denounced them. So why? Because he came after all these apostate anti-popes. He was in uh, around 1486, 1586, so all his predecessors were practicing it. So if it's true, when you're going to read what I'm going to read here, what he says, and it is true, that is formally heretical, it's, they're not Catholic even, he says, then he has to call his predecessors not Catholic, and he never did that. He never went as far as to then denounce people by name. He is guilty of non-judgmentalism for not denouncing the people. He did condemn it. He called it heresy and you're not Catholic. But he did not denounce the people who practiced it as automatically excommunicated idolater bastards, which means all of the predecessors that came before him and all the other people that practices in all the universities. Never said anything about them. Never even told people that they were automatically excommunicated. No. But I'm going to read it. You're going to read the proper condemn. Just, I'm going to quote from it. I've, I have it more fully in my book. I'm going to quote only a portion of it in here so you can look at his hypocrisy. But he's actually condemning his predecessors. So there you, there you have one. If he was, people will say popes can never make a mistake. Here's, if you believe he's a true pope, then he's condemning what these other so-called true popes did. And so either they're right, he's wrong, or he's wrong and they're right, but you can't have it both ways. But they're all apostate anti-popes, even him. And, and uh, mentioned, instead of saying, he also uh, never condemned the uh, desecrations of the holy places with images against the faith or morals. Said nothing about those. He didn't care about that. N nothing. He said or did nothing about it. So all he's really harping on here, his pet thing that he was correct about was astrology. So he's condemning that here. So Apostle Nancy Pope Sixtus V and Terre et Celi Creator, 1586. Bishop Sixtus IV, servant of the servant of gods. Let me correct that. Yeah, Apostle anti Pope Six is the fifth servant of the servants of Satan. It must be not doubted that in seeking the pre pre precognition of chance, circumstances, and important things to come, the devil acts with false intent. So that by his deceptions and tricks, he may turn men away from the path of salvation and trap them in the snare of damnation. Most notably of these are the astrologers once called mathematicians, the readers of birth signs, and those persons of the planetarii, who making a show of their false knowledge of the stars and constellations, and most rashly busying themselves, busying themselves to anticipate the decree of the divine order, which will in its own time be revealed, make their predictions with regard to the expectant mothers or the birthdays of men according to the movement of the constellations or the course of the stars. They pass judgments on the future events or even present events, as well as things hidden in the past, and they presume to have precognition and to make rash predictions from the births of children and from their birthdays, concerning their future status, circumstances, courses of life, offices, riches, offspring, salvation, death, journey, struggles, enmities, imprisonments, slaughters, various crises, and other events, good and bad. And not without great danger of error and infidelity do they do this. St. Augustine, the esteemed light of the church, makes clear that anyone who takes heed of these things or who studies them or who takes, or takes these persons into his home or who looks for truth in them has violated baptism in the Christian faith. We establish and commend by virtue of our apostolic authority that to the same decree as in the past, bishop, prelate, superiors, as well as inquisitors of heretical depravity. So he's got this under heretical depravity. He already said that it's contrary to the Christian faith, quoting St. Augustine. Diligently seek out and take harsh action in these cases in accordance with the church discipline against astrologers and others practicing the astrological arts. He's condemning his predecessors. He's condemning Sixtus IV, Julius II, Leo X, Paul II, Paul III, and I think I said Clement VII. They all practiced it. So they fall under it. So they don't have the Christian faith. They're idolaters. They're out of the church. They're heretical depravity. Sure, so he, re he correctly condemns astrology the right way. But why is he a non-judgmentalist? Because he did not denounce the people who practice it. If the shoe fits, wear it. He's not denouncing them. And when you don't denounce them, you don't punish them. 
so they remain in good standing. And everybody can come along and continue to practice astrology and say, well, you know, all these popes did it, and they were never denounced, so I'm going to continue to do it. And unless you also denounce the main perpetrators and punish them, if it's within your power to do so, the thing keeps getting perpetuated. So as a result of his insufficient condemnation here, he is an idolatrous astrologer because he did not denounce the people that practiced it. That is hypocrisy to the highest degree. And he said or did nothing about the desecration of holy places with images against the faith and morals. He was working in a Vatican that had the desecrated doors and St. Peter's and the whole place was desecrated, not just the Vatican. And he said nothing about that, though, so it didn't seem to bother him, right? We're going to get into, uh, it wasn't just astrology that was being practiced. There was other cult religions they were practicing, like the Gabala and their own Vulcan, the oracles from the false gods. This was all going on also. And before I make this first quote on this particular one so-called Catholic, nominal Catholic, apostate really, Pico Merindola, he practiced the Gabala. Now, what I want to talk about this, when I'm first reading this, Histories of Pope and it's coming to me, Pico Marandola was condemning astrology to the high heavens. And I went, we got a hero, Pico Marandola. He's condemning astrology. And you got your hopes up that you got a hero here at this. And then all of a sudden, you read it a couple pages later, he liked the Kabbalah instead. That's what he liked. I'm going to read about him right now. So this is what I told you. Just because some of these people condemned some things correctly, they were holding on to all types of heresies. They all had their pet heresies, and they had their pet dogmas they held on to. Well, this guy, Pika Mirandola, is one of them. And I went, oh, no. Pika, I said, Here's, no, he's practicing the Kabbalah. Well, let me read about him right here, and you'll see. It's from the History of Popes, Volume 5, Introduction, Part 2, page 154. Ficino's young friend, Pico della Mirandola, deserves perhaps to be called the most brilliantly gifted of all the members of the Platonic Academy in Florence. He was a humanist, too. Like the master he sought to demonstrate the fundamental agreement of all the heathen philosophers with each other and with Christian scholasticism and mysticism. So he had theophilosophy, so he's, he was also guilty of the heresy of scholasticism, but now he's mixing in also the Kabbalah. He's also mixing that in, another thing in this little soup of false religions. In his system, however, the most prominent place is given, not to Plato, but the fantastic esoteric doctrines of the Kabbalah. This attempt to find in Jewish mysticism a better support for Christianity than the old past of the great theologians can only be characterized as a mistake and a weakness. A mistake and a weakness? This is pastor speaking. He's already guilty of this. The guy's a stinking idolater. He's an infidel. The Kabbalah is a false religion. The Kabbalah is a religion, really, is even worse than just the Talmud alone, which is also a false religion. You're worshiping a false god. The Kabbalah is full of witchcraft, all kinds of spells and incantations. It's a book of warlocks, and he says it's just a weakness. It reminds you of like, well, he only committed, J.P. Two's kiss in the Quran was only a scandal. It was an error, but it was not an act of apostasy and idolatry. And, 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 and so, no, it wasn't. So they never really tell you what it was. So as a result, we're looking right here, and Pastor Alon on this point is guilty. He himself is guilty of, of all the sins of this Pico Mirandola because he did not correctly condemn the crime nor to denounce the criminal. Now we're going to go on to read again about him in Volume 5 again, Book 1, Chapter 6, pages 342 to 345. The arrival uh, in Rome of the famous Pico della Mirandola in the year 1486 brought to light the jealous care with which the integrity of faith was guarded in the papal city. Many of the opinions put forth by the gifted but fanciful and impulsive philosopher were made up of a confused medley of platonic and Kabbalistic notions, brimming over with youthful, amb youthful ambition and conceit. Youthful ambition. What does that got to do with youthful ambition? Young, old, or whatever. You, what, you, you, you can make an excuse. He was just young and he was... Pico announced his intention of holding a public disputation in which he would produce no less than 900 propositions in dialectics, morals, physics, mathematics, metaphysics, theology, magic, and Kabbalism for discussion. Some of these would by his own, the rest would, some of these would be his own, but the rest would be taken from the works of the Chaldean, Arab, Arabian, Hebrew, Greek, and Egyptian, and Latin sages. Now, we'll read this. The Pope, Innocent VIII, refused to permit the disputation 
and appointed a commission of bishops, theologians, and canons to examine them. This commission pronounced some of Pico's propositions to be heretical, rash, and likely to give scandal to the faithful. Many contradicted contained heathen philosophical errors, which had already been condemned. Others favored Jewish superstitions. The judgment was perfectly just and was adopted by innocent. And though a great number of the propositions were acknowledged to be Catholic and true, the reading of the whole series was forbidden on account of the admixture of falsehood. Now, we're going to put in this hypocrisy of innocent the eighth in this committee here. That's certainly true. Oh, yes. Then what about Aquinas and all these other people that were quoting philosophers and embracing their hurries? heresies? What about, we're talking about innocent the eighth now, who had bastard children. All right, the innocent VIII, who supported the, uh, who was working in the Vatican with the desecrated holy places, never said anything about them whatsoever. Practices simony. All right, and so here, here's a guy that doesn't condemn the desecrations in the holy places against morals and against against the faith and against morals, but his pet crime is here is the Kabbalah. He got angry because it was the Kabbalah. So that's his pet crime. So first of all, he, but he, what did he do? Okay, even though he's correctly condemning Pico Mirandola's use of the Kabbalism and all that. He never denounced them as an absolute idolater and outside the Catholic Church. He never denounced them. And you're going to read, so he's guilty of non-judgmentalism and non-punishmentalism because he insufficiently, he didn't denounce them nor did he punish them. We're going to read now how, how, how it makes a difference too because in the pontificate, right after Innocent VIII came, Apostate anti Pope Alexander VI, the notorious Borgia so-called Pope, and he's telling people, oh, guess I'm going to read it to you, that... I absolve Pico because he really was not a formal heretic, you know. So in other words, he wasn't really guilty. He's actually now coming out and saying it because I can see people probably arguing over it. This guy was never denounced. He should have been denounced. He's an idolater. This is a basic dogma, the first commandment. You're not allowed to be practicing Jewish Kabbalism, which is witchcraft. That's automatic guilt right away. You can't get off the hook. Well, let's read this. This is the next paragraph here. He, Pico della Mirandola, died November 17, 1494. In the previous year, the new pope, so-called Alexander VI, had an autograph brief, granted him absolution in case he might have indirectly violated his oath, and also the assurance that neither by his apology nor in any other way did he, has he ever been guilty of formal heresy. So he wasn't, again, they condemned the crime. It's idolatrous. It's again, but guess what? He's not an idolater. The crimes don't stick to nobody, even when they do condemn them. It never sticks. So he's he pronouncing them not guilty of formal heresy. There is no mention in the brief, as had been asserted by some writers, of the of the thesis is condemned by Innocent the Eighth. So he sort of tried to ignore that. Because maybe if you brought that up, they would have said, well, then how come he's not a formal heretic? I mean, it's, it's more than heresy. It's idolatry, too, when you practice the Kabbalah. So I can practice the Kabbalah, and I can get away with it. I, I'm, I'm innocent. I'm still a cat. This is so. This is non-judgmentalism and non-punishmentalism at its best, or should I say at its worst. It's con it goes on continually. That's how these criminals stay in the ranks of the church. So They're not really in the church, but appear to be Catholic in good standing in imprimatur books, and it continues to go on and on. Pretty soon after that, then they lift this book off and people say, well, look, he was never condemned personally, so I'm going to do the same thing he did. And it did. He wasn't the only one that did this. And at the same time, Innocent VIII and Alexander VI were absolutely idolatrous bastards for supporting uh, mythology and, and uh, idols, false gods, false religions, desecrating holy places, and many other crimes, too. So they were out on other points. Now, we're gonna, here we read again about apostate Catholics during that time consulting pagan oracles History of Popes, um, I think, I'm not sure, I don't know, this, uh, I get the source on this, I, it just talks in here, uh, it's a footnote, and it might have been volume 5, intro, introduction, page 2, page 152, I'm not sure if that's the source, but I'm going to quote it. It just says, Roman sorcery in the 14th century is described in Bertoli's article in the Revista Europa, 1883, Augusto 16. He's talking about, that's how prevalent it was in the 14th, this is in the 14th century, the 1300s, about Roman sorcery witchcraft that was going on in Rome. But now I'm going to also read from History of Pope, Volume 5, Introduction, Part 2, page 152. Astrology, however, was only one of the many other prevalent superstitions. Very many of the humanists were amazingly credulous in regard to wonders and prophecies. Poggio, a notorious pig, filthy, idolatrous humanist who was at the papal court and favored by three or four popes in a row. Poggio was a firm believer in the prodigies of the sort that are found in the classics. It was true that oracles had disappeared and that the gods could not now be inquired of, but it became very much the fashion to open a page of Virgil at random and to interpret the lines which first met the eye as an omen. The influence of the demonology of the later paganism can be distinctly be traced in prevailing beliefs on that subject in the Renaissance. 
the printing of the works of Jambilikos or Abamam uh, on the Egyptian mysteries in a Latin translation towards the end of the 15th century is a proof of this. Even the Platonic Academy in Florence was not wholly free from the hankering after these and similar Neoplatonic delusions of the decadent Roman Empire. There were also a revival, also in the belief in the possibility of subjecting demons and obliging them to work for human ends. Sixtus IV found it necessary to direct a brief against some Carmelites in Bologna who had maintained that there was no harm in asking for things from demons. So they were asking for things from demons. They were practicing uh, uh, the oracles. They were going after the false gods and mythological books for oracles. And six is the fourth right here. This is his pet dogma. He's correct about it. It is wrong. You, you can't invoke demons. He's right about that. Six is the fourth. But what was his pet idolatry? He practiced astrology. He practiced astrology. That's what he liked. And at the same time, he never said or did anything about the idols that were desecrating the churches against the images with images against the faith and morals. So here, here this guy, he's condemning. You can't invoke demons, but you can invoke the stars. Who do you think is behind star worship? Who do you think is behind all the false gods? The demons. So he's saying you can take an indirect path to Satan, but not a direct path. That's what he's saying here. The hypocrisy, folks, I'm telling you, it stinks. You think you got a hero? You don't got a hero. Watch out for these nominal Catholic books that only tell you the good things these guys did. And leave out all the bad things so you think they're heroes. They're not. They're abominable. This guy practiced astrology. I just read that earlier. If you go back and listen to what I said, he was one of your guys who practiced astrology. And let alone the fact that he also uh, supported, I think he might even openly support it, if not at least he allowed, the desecrations of holy places. Now it goes on to say, or many of the errors into which the philosophers of the age of the Renaissance fell were alike. These superstitions connected with the classical craze. It's coming from that whole thing of idolizing mythology and all that. They're, they're consulting the pagan oracles and all that. So there you go. That's on that section right there. Now we're going to talk about one of the uh, crimes of immorality as a result of the lack of faith. Homosexuality, sodomy, was rampant amongst everybody. It started out with the higher classes, then infected the layman, and it just ran rift. And I got testimony on the, how rampant homosexuality was, especially among the clerics, from Peter Damien, who was alive in the 11th century and wrote many letters condemning a lot of these things, many testimonies, and his famous letter 31, which is called the Book of Gomorrah, talks about bishops and priests infected with homo crime, a lot of them, rampant, he says. It's so bad he had to write this letter about homosexuality. And he's actually writing it to the Pope and he's warning him that you're taking it too easy on these people. These people who are prelates or priests doing this should be defrocked and never allowed to practice again. He was letting them make, give them some light penances and let them continue in their offices. And he said, you cannot do this. And he, was make, and he was getting the bishops off easier than the priests. He said, the higher they are, the more guilty they are. You cannot let them off with light punishments. So he's already writing to the Pope at that time and saying, even though you condemn it and you're denouncing these people, you're not punishing them sufficiently. So these popes at that time, as Peter Damien's letters make clear, are non-punishmentalists and he is crying out to them for justice and saying you must sufficiently punish them but in his book he gives you a testimony in the, in the 11th century of how rampant homosexuality and sodomy was amongst the clerics Peter Damien letter 31 aka the book of Gomorrah, of Gomorrah to Pope Leo IX 1049 paragraph 7 in our region a certain abominable and most shameful vice has developed the befouling cancer of sodomy is in fact spreading so through the clergy, or rather like a savage beast, is raging with such shameless abandon through the flock of Christ, not just the clergy, even the layman. Ravaging, he says, it's not just a few cases. It would be better for them, homosexual priests, to perish alone as laymen than after having changed their attire, but not their disposition, to drag others with them to destruction. As truth itself testifies, which it says, but if anyone is a cause of a stumbling block to one of these little ones, it would be better for him to be drowned in the depths of the sea with a great millstone round his neck. Matthew 18, 16, end quote. 
You go, it's, it's, a, it's one of his biggest letters. You go on to read it and he's complaining about even when they're punished, they're not being sufficiently punished. And, and, and he goes into detail onto a lot of stuff. Doing. It's disgusting. He does it the right way, though, but it shows you how rampant it was. And it he, he, he was absolutely necessary for him to write this letter or for his own sake even, you know, to save his own soul and to warn. But the big thing, the gist of the whole thing, is the proper punishments weren't even being done. Now we're going to read about, again, homosexuality and sodomy from the history of popes from volume 5, the introduction, section 2, pages 101 and 131 to 135. There is unmistakably, unmistakable evidence of the revival of the horrible national vice of the Greeks, sodomy. Clothed in the graceful robes of Greek myths and lightly sung by Roman poets, it slipped noiselessly back into the modern world in the beginning of the 15th century. Now we know that's not correct, it goes back further. He's not being quite honest, but he didn't go back that far in his research as pastor, but this is not true. It went, it was even at the time of Peter Damien, all right? So you may be reading this and say, okay, it began in the 15th century. No, it didn't. You just read from Peter Damien. It was rampant back then, so he's not right about that. It was already back in the, in the 11th century. In the beginning of the 15th century, it was to be found in Venice, Siena, and, Na and Naples. In Naples... Bernardino of Siena publicly preached against it and declared that God would send fire from heaven to destroy the city as he destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. Of the later mission preachers, Roberto di Lecce, Michel de, 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 da Milano, and Gabriel la Barletta were those who raised their voices most loudly against this growing curse. Romans won curse, so it is a result. In Venice, the state endeavored by legislation and severe penalties to check this form of corruption, but in vain. Why in vain? Because God would not allow you to overcome your sins of immorality because of the first and worst crimes you were committing, which are sins against the faith. And when you commit sins against the faith in the first commandment that are directly against God, God puts you under this grace, a curse of the Romans one curse of gross immorality. You can punish him, you can kill him, you can hang him in public, and it ain't going to end. Because the first crime you're committing is theophilosophy, the heresy of scholasticism, glorifying the mythological gods, and all these sins against the faith. That's why they couldn't stop it even when they tried to stop it. The advocates that are false rent, down to today, they haven't stopped it. This has been going on for a thousand years, believe me. What's going on in the back rooms of these places is horrible. The advocates of the false renaissance openly and unblushingly extolled the unnatural vices which had been the ruin of the ancient world. Some actually made a boast of such practices. Others excused them on the ground that they were not condemned by the noblest men among the ancients. All these, all these noble men practiced it and loved it. The models whom the humanists made it the, made it the, the one aim of their lives to resemble. In his seventh satire, Ariosto says that almost all the humanists, and these are nominal Catholics, by the way, folks, on the papal court, were addicted to the vice for which God destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. They were almost, they're all homos. Almost all of them, he said, sod practicing sodomy. Other wholesale accusations formulated in a scandal st scandalous age did not spare even Michelangelo's character. Of course not. Look at the statues he painted. The guy was a flaming homo. Just look at their work. They're obsessed by nakedness of women and men. Still in regard to many of the humanists, setting aside what may be only poetical embroideries, their own writings prove that it is not unfounded. Tomponius Latus, in answer to charges of this nature, cited the example of Socrates and the poet Cosmico. Cosmi quoted a poem of Plato. They supported homosexual stuff. There can be hardly any doubt that most of distinguished, the most distinguished poet and humanist at the court of Lorenzo de' Medici, Angelo Poliziano, the Venetian chronicler Sanuto, and the Venetian envoy in Rome in the time of Innocent VII, Antonio Loredano, were all guilty of this vice. The most serious part of it, as far as the nation was concerned, was that it made its way into the lower ranks also amongst the laymen. At the time of the invasion of Charles VIII, the chronicler writes, the whole country and all the great cities, Rome, Florence, Naples, Bologna, Ferrara, are infected. Many preachers attribute all the misfortunes of the Italians, the wars, the dirts, the earthquakes, to the wrath of God on account of this sin. Wrong. That's not the main reason. The main reasons were sins against the faith. Yes, God will destroy you for this too. I'm not saying that. So that's partially true, but it's a half-truth. The first reason was scholasticism and the glorification of the false gods and the idols and the desecration of the places. That's the main reason, all right? 
So they didn't see a lot of these guys are not getting the whole picture. A lot of these guys that are condemning sodomy, they were scholastics themselves or glorifying the mythologies. They were more guilty than the sodomites even. Those are sins against the faith. The, 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 these are sins against morals. Now he goes on to say, when in 1511, Venice was visited with a violent earthquake, the patriarch told this turf, his terrified countrymen that this was a punishment for, from God because they would not give up their vices. Partially true, not totally true. Vices, it wasn't just vices. You have to give up your sins against the faith. And that's why all these guys were confounded all these years and could not purify anything, even now. In the Vatican II Church with all the pedophilia. It was also rampant back then and, and never stopped pedophilia. It goes on, pedophilia has been going on for, I'm sure, like a thousand years, since the year 11th century even. You're going to read about that here in a second. So it hasn't stopped. And none of, them, none of them for the life of them can see what I'm saying here and trying to tell these people was because of their sins against the faith. And that's why they're in the operation of earth. They accepted scholasticism and the glorification of mythological gods. Even if they can't, if they don't want to practice the mythological gods, they invent ones like J.R. Tolkien's Lord of the Rings. That's all mythology. They're all enamored by it. They're superheroes. It's all mythology stuff. So they create new ones, a new mythologies. Now we're quoting from Bernardina Siena in the 15th century. And he says, Oh, Italy, how much more than any other providence have you become contaminated? Go to the Germans and hear what lovely things they say about the Italians. They say there is no people in the world that are greater sodomites than the Italians. Ooh. Cursed sodomy was always detested by all those who lived according to God. Such passion for undue forms, undue forms borders on madness. This vice disturbs the intellect, breaks the elevated and generous state of the soul, drags great thoughts to petty ones, makes men pusillanimous and irascible, obstinate and hardened, servilely soft and incapable of anything. Furthermore, the well-being, the, the will being agitated by the insatiable drive for pleasure no longer follows reason but for furor. And we're reading, as a, uh, he's talking about the Germans here, there's a really good quote I came across in History of Popes relating to that, and it's in volume six, page, uh, book one, chapter six, page 151, footnote, and it says, what the German knight, A. von Harf, thought in the year 1497 of the Rome of the Borgias has already been told. A similar impression is conveyed in the words of a Rhinelander who had been in Cardinal Briconet's service, retailed by Vittori. Quote, if you ask me why I left Rome, I answer that we Rhinelanders are good Christians and have, ne and have read and heard that the Christian faith has been founded on the blood of the martyrs and good morals and many miracles, so that it would be impossible for anyone who lived here to become an unbeliever. But I spent several years in Rome and saw the lives led by the prelates and dignitaries, and had I stayed there any longer, I should have been in danger not only of losing my faith, but of becoming an Epicurean and doubting the immortality of my soul. That's how bad it was. And here he is. They were given that lie about that you can never judge the Pope, he can never go wrong, the Romans, everything they do is good and impeccable. Well, he's given first-hand testimony, wow, how opposite that is. I had to get out of the joint or I'm dead. I have to get out of the place or I'm dead. You know, it's, it's, it's like uh, a little story I'll tell you quick here, or our brother Ron. He, uh, where was that uh, place you visited where, where, where there was homos in it? Kansas. Okay, so you went in there, right, and you're going to stay one night there, yeah. right? And then there was, what, you heard the homos doing, there were homoing around, or the guy tried to molest yeah, you or something. Yeah, uh, so, he, so he was staying in some monastery for a night in Kansas. Uh, what was the name of it? Do you remember? Well, I don't. It was Israel, a monastery. But. In Kansas. Well, one of the monks tried to approach him to do the homo thing, right? So Ron got up and left, and that was it, you know, and he left. And he was going to go to the bishop, right? Mm -hmm. And he did. He went to the bishop's place, and he was going to report the monks. And do you remember who the bishop was or the place or what no, it was? I don't. No. Anyway, he he knocks on the he knocks on the door to the bishops to, to report him. The guy answers and he goes, Who's he go? Can I help you? <laughs> yeah. A real flaming oh. faggot. So what did you what did you so you, you just oh, that, that was it. and he says, uh, no, I, I don't think you can help me. You know? It was more words went on that, but he was a real flaming faggot. You know? Oh can I help you? I told him, but I mean, boom, that was it. I oh, you did it, tell him, yeah. Wasn't going but you know what, he did tell the guy, but he knew it wasn't going No, After he heard the way the guy was talking, he was a flaming fruitcake. So, there you go, right? I, what I'm saying is, if Ron would have stayed in that monastery more than a night or two, they would have jumped his bones, man. They would have raped him. And my point is, 
You can't stay in an environment like that. Rome is a cesspool of iniquity but at this time, and it still has never stopped being a cesspool. Just look at the churches. It reflects the people. They hit it a little bit better later on, but it was still there. And if we get the writings on these guys, you see what's going on in the back rooms. Your hair will stand. All right, so that's the end of that section.